today we have uh, two presenters. Um, Dr. Gray Nearing uh, is an assistant professor in uh, geological sciences here at UA uh, and is currently serving a temporary appointment with, um, with Google as a visiting faculty member in research. Uh, we also have uh, Mashrapur Rahman, uh, who is a PhD student working with Dr. Nearing. Um, and what they're going to talk about today is some really fascinating research they've been doing, which essentially is um, you know, um, focused on mapping the literature of hydrology. So uh, without any further introduction, I'll just turn it over to one of you. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> I'll be the one to uh, present. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm just going to sh start sharing my screen, if that's okay. Cool, so can everyone see my screen? All right. Yeah, it looks good. Yes. Awesome. Okay, um, so, um, so Gray, uh, do you want to say something before I start or should I just uh, go start? Yeah, I'll just say a few words. So Mash is gonna present, uh, Mash is my PhD student. He's been here since 2017. 18. And, I'm sorry, 2018. And yeah. uh, so you're in your, Second year now, right? Yes, just started my third third year. Like, yeah. I can add on good days. Um, <laughs> so Mash has really taken over this project. Um, uh, he's going to tell you all about it, but but I'm just going to basically turn it over to you. Might as well do it yourself, Mash. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, so today we're going to talk about uh, leveraging data science towards a deeper understanding of scholarly li literature. So. Um, this is basically uh, the project that I've been working on uh, recently, on, uh, like doing topic modeling on hydrology literature. Uh, so before I get started, I, I want to thank uh, NASA Advanced Information Systems Technology Program for funding this work and uh, the Department of Geological Sciences for their support and the University of Alabama Libraries for their support as well. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's get started. So I'm going to start with the background. So let's have a look at the problem uh, that we are facing nowadays. So there's a lot of like text data that's available to us. And so, so we want to make uh, the best use of it, right? So we want to support uh, like all the knowledge that is available through the textual data to support um, like policymakers um, and like even help out scientists. And like nowadays, like since uh, this is um, like our work is like related to hydrology, nowadays like there's a, there's sort of a drive to. Uh, uh, for hydrologists to advocate their own work, so um, so we want to like we want to be able to like support uh, everyone with the knowledge and the tools uh, to uh, knowledge and the tools for their work. Um, so, if you consider uh, the amount of um, the amount of like papers uh, uh, published in hydrology between. 1991 and 2019. And uh, we are considering here uh, like six major journals in hydrology. So they are hydrology and earth system science, uh, sciences journal and hydrological processes, hydrologic sciences journal, journal of hydrology, journal of hydrometeorology and water resources research. So if you consider uh, just by the sheer numbers of these six journals, there are about like 42,154 articles uh, like published between uh, 1991 and 2019. So, uh, so these, these articles, like if, if someone wants to get into this field or like synthesize the data, it, it's a nightmare. So, um, so we ideally we want to make use of all this like textual data, but we also want it to do it, uh, so want to do it like faster and in a way that is like, you know, interactive and like uh, comprehensible to uh, everyone. Okay, uh, so 
Moving on, uh, let's have a quick look at uh, the our discipline that like, well, well, our work sort of lies in between the intersection of um, natural language processing and uh, hydrology. But let's have a quick look at what natural language processing is, right? So if you consider uh, computational linguistics and artificial intelligence, natural language processing lies somewhere in the middle. So uh, there's natural language understanding and then there's natural language generation right so uh, and also when you consider natural language understanding uh, we have uh, an intersection with like deep learning and machine learning uh, so this is the part of, uh, like we're interested in uh, so if we uh, have a quick look at the history of natural language processing it kind of started uh, during like the 1940s like late 1940s with like Claude Shannon uh, in his paper, uh, like uh, in his paper on entropy, like he talks about uh, like uh, words as like, you know, discrete uh, sources of information that can be like conveyed over certain like uh, media, right? So embed, uh, like encoding them and then like, you know, uh, communicating the signal and then decoding it. Uh, and then in the 1950s, you see the George, IBM Georgetown experiment where they first use machine translation to uh, like translate uh, Russian uh, sentences, like 60 Russian sentences to English. And then like uh, late 1950s and 1960s, you see uh, like the famous works uh, by Noam Chomsky. And like, so he basically like talks about uh, natural, like, uh, natural language, uh, the statistical nature of natural language and then we have uh, some more development over like uh, from 1960s to 1990s and like you know late 1990s you we see the advent of the first word embeddings uh, so word embeddings or word representations or word vectors are basically statistical representations of words so like uh, human language converted to statistics and then and then like in to, uh, like during 2008 and like you know early 2000s 2010s you see uh, natural language processing and multitask learning coming into effect and uh, you see like uh, christopher manning's work with work to vector uh, like at cambridge and so, uh, and then we have sequen uh, sequential, uh, like sec to sec models, and then convolutional neural networks. And then nowadays we are using transformer models that are based on this attention paper. And uh, like very recently, we have like, you know, huge uh, pre trained models such as GPT 2 and like Megatron. That, uh, that's uh, Megatron, that was like a huge like uh, transformer model that was trained by um, like NVIDIA for like, you know, for millions of dollars. Yeah, so so natural language processing is taking off. This, uh, that's all I'm saying. So if you consider the conventional applications of natural language processing, we're using it all day long, right? So we're using when we are doing doing Google searches, uh, when we are texting someone, when we are sort of um, uh, when we are talking to Alexa. Um, or, or some other AIs, right? So, um, so, so some of these, uh, like, uh, like some of these uh, applications include information retrieval, sentiment analysis, which uh, deals with human emotions in text and like, hum uh, uh, like in text. And then there's information extraction, question answering. So these would be like chatbots and automated, uh, like, you know, uh, automatic um, answering machines or something like that. And then we have machine translation, which basically translates uh, between uh, languages. Uh, so uh, we are like for this project we are working on, the project that we're working on, we are interested in information retrieval and information extraction. Um, okay, moving on to the approaches that are adopted in natural language processing. So there's distributional approaches. So this makes uh, proper use of statistics. These are like, you know, uh, machine learning methods, like you know, they make use of big data. And then like we have frame-based approaches, basically stereotype approaches, like, you know, when you are solving a crime, you uh, sort of provide a, some clues within the sentence and uh, it pertains to something. And then there's uh, uh, the model theoretical approach where like it takes into account the model theory and the compositionality. Uh, and then we have interactive learning approaches uh, where the machine learns by interacting with humans. So this is a very interesting approach. So what we are interested or like what we are working on uh, or what we're working with is distributional approaches. Uh, okay, so moving on, um, let's have a look at data and preparation. Uh, so 
So in order to like, you know, get the data or acquire the data, uh, we used uh, sort of uh, two uh, sources. The first source is the Web of Science core collection. And if you can access it, um, you can actually download uh, the abstracts and their corresponding metadata in the form of BIP files. And um, so this is the website that you can go to. So it's pretty easy to acquire. So that's, uh, that's how we acquired the abstracts and the metadata. Um, and uh, if you sort of like, uh, if we can, if you consider the journal websites, so this is uh, this is for the full text. So that was for abstracts, and now we are uh, like acquiring the full text. So for the full text uh, uh, data, we use custom web scrapers to go through uh, uh, to iteratively go through uh, like different DOIs and like uh, acquire the uh, acquire the like the full text PDFs and download them. Um, uh, so some of these journals will uh, require you to have a click-through license, but uh, that you can acquire through uh, Crossref Text and Data Mining API. And uh, so you can get a click-through license and then obtain an uh, API token and then sort of uh, induct it in your web scraper to download the files iteratively. Um, so that's a very uh, useful tool. Um, so this is again uh, the website uh, that you can use to acquire uh, the API, uh, so, uh, used to acquire the token. Uh, okay, so moving on to the next part, uh, which is topic modeling. So here's the interesting part. Uh, so let's have a look at the literature of topic modeling and so topic modeling has been has been in effect for a while and people have been using multiple different uh, or like different types of approaches for topic modeling using latent semantic analysis, latent durational allocation, uh, LDA to VEC and so on and so forth. So you see the application of uh, like uh, topic modeling in multiple fields. So you can see uh, it being applied in transportation research, um, co cog science, social science, hydropower research and like, so you'd also see uh, it being applied in like, you know, foreign language. Uh, so history of germ German studies and cloud computing. And so we are uh, so sort of doing the same work um, in a different way for uh, like hydrology literature. So this, uh, this is, um, uh, this is an, a screenshot from Earth Archive. And uh, so it's on Earth Archive and it's uh, like, uh, we're uh, it's submitted to WRR and it's in review. Um, so um, let's uh, quickly go through, not quickly, okay, let's go through the pre-processing routine. So uh, in a precursor to any good topic model or any model is to give it good data. You have to feed it good data uh, in canonical format uh, to uh, like sort of uh, get good quality of topics uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so here's just a simple like schematic. Uh, to sort of depict uh, how we did it. So after we downloaded the data, uh, so we convert it into text files, right? And then we uh, clean the data by removing the punctuations, nonsensical text and symbols and stop words. And then like uh, we, and then we prepared the data by tokenizing, building bigrams, trigrams, and then lemmatizing, and then converting it into this format, the term frequency inverse document frequency format that is required by uh, the LDM model inside the gen inside a library called GenSim, and so uh, we uh, so uh, so that's how we sort of pre-process the data. So. If we, if we go into details, uh, so what are the libraries that are required uh, to do it? Or like, you can use various libraries, but we used a GenSim natural language toolkit and then Spacey. So Spacey is a, mu is a much faster, like, you know, um, uh, tagger and like, uh, you can use it to like, you know, uh, do lemmatization uh, very like efficiently and forms biograms, trigrams efficiently. Uh, so, so these are the functions. Um, so uh, before I go to that, I want to mention that like, you know, people can choose different languages to uh, coding languages to do it. But in our case, we use Python. So this is, uh, we are, this is here, uh, like this is us defining the functions uh, for cleaning and preparation in Python. So uh, 
we also remove the stop words, right? So, so stop words would be words like in, the, on. Uh, so some words like small words that do not actually contribute to the, uh, like, you know, equality of the topics. So taking them out is a better option. So uh, we um, remove the stop words and then we form bigrams. So bigrams are something like, okay, so you have words such as uh, climate and then change, uh, but like it's more sort of intuitive to combine them together, right? So instead of just climate and change, we combine them together to form climate change. And then trigrams uh, is for three words, right? So if there's something like climate change impact, so we, we can combine like climate and change and impacts together to form uh, climate change impacts. But uh, so you can actually keep going up, like uh, you can go for four words and five words, you can even do phrases, but there's a problem with that. Um, so like, you know, with text data, there's a high chance when you're forming this uh, trigrams and like n-grams and phrases, there's a high chance for data sparsity. So it's, it's, it's imperative that we uh, be careful about that. And uh, so, and lemmatizens, uh, lemmatization is a sort of axing the word. So if you think about something like, you know, going, go, gone, something like that, uh, it, uh, lemmatization, what it does is that slashes the words to just go, right? So uh, it, it removes some like, uh, like nonsensical uh, sort of meanings or nonsensical words that won't necessarily contribute uh, to our um, uh, like uh, to a better model. Okay, so that's pre-processing, and now let's uh, move on to our model, which is latent Dirichlet allocation. Uh, so latent Dirichlet allocation, it was first sort of uh, published uh, or like you know uh, written by Bly uh, in two thousand and three. Uh, so what is the idea behind this uh, latent Dirichlet allocation algorithm? Uh, so think about it like this. So consider this document. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a document from ge uh, genetic sciences. And so this is a document about uh, like how, like whether some genes contribute to the survival of some species over time, right? So uh, the idea behind LDA is that documents exhibit multiple topics. Uh, now, uh, here in this in this sort of picture, you can see words such as like computational numbers, computer analysis, and predictions colored in blue, and they sort of uh, indicate uh, sort of data analysis and computer science, right? And then like the words that are uh, like colored in yellow, such as like uh, the genome, sequenced, genetic genes, so they sort of pertain to genetics, right? And then you have um, words such as organism, survive, life, uh, and organism. So they, they sort of pertain to uh, biology, okay? So now imagine coloring like all the words in the same way. And then throwing out like, you know, words such as in, the, and on, and just leave. And then like uh, from a distance, if you squint at this paper, uh, you'll uh, like, you, uh, you'll say that like, you know, okay, so I don't, I don't really know what this paper is about, but like, you know, looking at the words, it seems like uh, the paper blends together uh, like data science and genetics and biology. So what a latent judicial allocation does is that it takes this intuition and, you know, casts it as uh, like a formal probabilistic model of text, okay? Um, Ash, we so, have a we have a quick question uh, in chat. Um, how did you go from a PDF to a text? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we we used a, a converter. The PDF uh, it's a PDF to text converter. Um, uh, so there's this library available, and we did it on like uh, you know through our command line uh, through a shell script. Probably yeah. Uh, so yeah, we did that. So. Uh, so uh, what I'll do is like, you know, um, I'll take the questions after the presentations, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so let's uh, have a, like, uh, let's try to understand how, uh, like, let's try to understand the intuition behind LDA a bit more, okay? So as we previously discussed, uh, documents contain topics, right? So uh, let's say we consider a hundred topics. So and each topic uh, would have 
a mixture of words or in formal terms, there would be a distribution of words uh, within a fixed vocabulary or a vocabulary or however you want to pronounce it. Um, so, uh, so LDA, so uh, we, we will try to understand this. The best way to understand this is to understand the generating process uh, that uh, LDA does, right? So if, if we consider the distribution, um, so this is the distribution that like sort of LDA assumes, right? And then, uh, so let's say, uh, and these colors, so these colors, uh, each of these colors are topics, right? And each of these topics would have some words. So what LDA does is that it iteratively sort of picks one color and then picks a word associated with that color and counts it. And it keeps doing that for all words within the document. And then it goes to the next document and then it keeps going and keep go it keeps going and keeps going. Uh, okay, so, so let's try to understand it in a formal manner. Uh, so Leighton Dirichlet allocation, uh, so it, uh, as we already discussed, it, discussed, it uh, assumes a generating model. So it tries to model like how the corpus was produced, right? Uh, so if you consider uh, like this, so this is a, a graphical model representation and it's an intuitive way to understand the model. So uh, there, uh, so uh, we are considering uh, three uh, random variables. So these are uh, the uh, per document topic distribution, so per document uh, per topic word distribution, and so alpha here is the Dirichlet prior on the per document topic distribution, and beta here is the Dirichlet prior for the uh, per uh, like uh, topic word distribution. And so ZDI here is the topic assignment uh, for each word within the document. So we ideally we want to infer the uh, per document topic distribution and uh, the uh, per topic. Um, oops. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So ideally we want to. Uh, we want to infer the per document topic distribution and the per word topic distribution and the per word topic assignments uh, to like get the posterior expectations. And then we can use the posterior expectations to do all sorts of analysis. We can do inter information retrieval. We can do uh, like, you know, information extraction, um, like, and, you know, posterior analysis. We can do a whole lot of things, okay? Uh, so that's basically in a nutshell what LDA is. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, so if we, if we want to like, you know, uh, so if we are training the model, we are looking to, for like, you know, good quality topics and we need evaluation metrics. So there's, uh, there are two like fundamentally two different uh, like types of evaluation metrics. So these are intrinsic and extrinsic. So considering intrinsic evaluation metrics, um, uh, a very popular one is topic coherence. So this is basically a measure of the similarity and semantics between the high probability words in a topic or in a more simpler manner, it it just uh, it's a measure for the quality of the topics. Whether the word that LDA you know thinks that belongs within the topic does actually belong in the topic. So it, it's a uh, it's, it's, uh, so coherence indicates that. So we, ideally, we want the coherence to be as high as possible. And then we have another evaluation metric, which is perplexity, and it's basically um, a measure of how surprised the model is with the introduction of new data. Um, and so lower value indicates a better model fit. So we want uh, like a lower value of perplexity with increasing number of topics. Um, so, uh, so, we, uh, when, so when we want to like find out the optimum number of topics, and this is very important because you don't want to overshoot the number of topics or undershoot it or so, so we want to reach that sweet spot, right? So, and the best way to, uh, or, you know, uh, the way to do it is to have, have a look at the perplexity and coherence scores, the coherence and perplexity scores for multiple topics. So what we did is we trained the model on multiple topics starting from zero till 50. And, um, and, we, and we like observed like how perplexity and coherence varied. So we sort of like, you know, it gave, it gave us a ballpark between like 25 to 30 topics as being the optimal and then we use extrinsic evaluation metric which is like our like you know subjective perception to understand like you know what's the best um, like or what's the optimal number of topics 
Okay, so uh, let's have a quick look at model training. Uh, so there are multiple like you know libraries that you can use uh, in Python for um, uh, for training the LDA. The most popular is of course GenSim, and so GenSim has both the default LDA model and the LDA multi-core model. So LDA multi-core model is what it does is that it parallelizes the routine, and so it's much faster. So if you can do that, if you have some computational uh, resources available to you, it's always better to use that. Um, so there are certain hyperparameters that you can adjust to, like you know, get good quality of topics. So <clears throat> there's chunk size and passes uh, being the most important one. So chunk size is the number of documents or the uh, number of documents that uh, the model iterates through. Uh, each time and uh, the number of uh, passes. So you don't, uh, so you don't want to like, you know, set the chunk size to like too high uh, because, uh, you know, the model would update, um, you know, the weights, the uh, topic weights, um, like over like each iteration. So uh, if you set it too low, then like it won't update properly. And similarly for passes, like you want to set it uh, as high as possible. Um, so, uh, there's uh, like when you think so one must think so okay if I put it like you know if I uh, tune these parameters hyperparameters uh, too high like to too high so like if we set the passes and iterations to too high then is there a chance of overfitting so um, so you there's a very minimal risk of doing that with um, with LDA because it fall follows Bayesian statistics and so the risk of overfitting is much lower. Um, so, uh, oopsie, yeah, there, uh, yeah, okay. So have a, uh, let's have a look at the quality of topics uh, that are, uh, are like, you know, the topics that were generated from our training routine. So, but first of all, we need to identify those topics, right? And so, so we used a library in Python known as Word Cloud. And so the Word Cloud, like if you look at these things, so these are uh, like, you know, these words, these like sort of um, agglomerates of words. Uh, these are like basically showing um, the most likely words appearing within a certain topic. Uh, so uh, the model, um, like here model seems to be the most popular uh, sort of word within this topic. So it's like larger. And uh, so if you consider like snow hydrology here, you can see this, the word snow appearing in that topic like much more frequently. And therefore you have uh, uh, like, you know, snow and cover like and snow melt, like these, like the larger words they show like, uh, they're most li more likely to appear in the topic. And so we identified the topics uh, in multiple ways, right? So we, uh, we did uh, sort of like a subjective analysis of the topic. So we sent, uh, you know, so we sent it over to, uh, like we sent these topics over to like experts um, and they, they would be hydrologists in the United States and all over the world. And uh, so they, uh, they gave us inputs and that kind of helped us identify the topics. Um, so, uh, and we also then looked at the trends of the topics and i.e. like how they are varying over time. So you can see uh, topics such as precipitation, variability and extremes and climate change um, and like water management and precipitation observation, they are like sort of uh, increasing in popularity over time uh, in, in the six journals in question. So in, within the six journals that we uh, did our analysis on, uh, we have uh, like, um, uh, like these uh, topics trending over time. Uh, and like, if you consider uh, like the converse, so you'd have like soil moisture sort of decreasing in popularity, uh, statistical hydrology and like uh, sediment and erosion and, and hydrogeology sort of decreasing in popularity, subsurface flow and transport decreasing in pop popularity. So uh, it is, uh, sort of shows like, you know, um, some of the subsurface topics. Uh, so subsurface would be uh, like, you know, when we consider like hydrogeology and subsurface topics. So these are basically uh, like as a uh, hydrologist, what we think of uh, like surface hydrology and then subsurface hydrology. So water which flows like over the surface of the ground. So that's surface hydrology and water which flows below the surface that um, a surf, uh, subsurface hydrology. And that also includes like groundwater uh, and uh, those things. Okay. Um, Okay, so these are uh, sort of like, um, this is an example of uh, the 
um, you know, the data we sent over to the experts uh, for, you know, identifying the topics. And as you can see, um, like, um, each word within the topic has a relative strength of relationship with the topic. And, and we also backtrack into our corpus, um, the corpus being uh, the, uh, I mean, our data set. So corpus is like the natural language processing term for a set of text documents, right? Um, by the way, the um, plural for corpus is not corpi, it's corpora. So if, if you're, and it's Latin, right? So if you're, if you're saying corpi, then, you know, you didn't st study Latin in high school. Uh, so, uh, okay, so, so these are the papers associated with topics. And uh, so uh, we sent this over and we got back expert feedback and we sort of incorporated uh, their sort of feedback into our findings. So there are certain um, other interactive exploration tools such as PyLDAVIS. So PyLDA visualization is um, sort of like it, what it does is takes like these like, you know, high dimensional topical problems and projects it into a two dimensional intertopic distance map. And so you can browse over this circle. So each of these circles are, uh, are a topic and like you can browse over the circles and have a look at the words that are within these topics, right? And you can adjust this little bar here to uh, adjust the relevance metric. And so uh, with a higher relevance metric, you'd have words that are more likely to appear within the topic on the top and the converse uh, is true as well. Okay, uh, so moving on to the next section. So that's basically our methodology. Uh, in the next section, we're gonna have a look at the results and the analysis. Um, so, uh, so this is interesting because let's have a look at the evolution of topics. Uh, so we wanted to understand our, like we wanted to understand ourselves and also give other hydrologists and like, you know, stakeholders in this area, um, you know, an idea about how the topics are like sort of segregated by the model with increasing number of topics. So we train the model on different number of topics, right? We train the model on two topics that is on the like right, left here. And then we train the model on um, like five topics and 10 topics and 15 and 25. Uh, so 25 being our optimal number of topics, right? So you can see like, you know, when we are trained, when we train the model on two topics, um, you can see a clear distinction between surface and subsurface hydrology. So surface hydrology and subsurface hydrology is clearly sort of like segregated by the model. And, and then um, uh, you, ha you have like, you know, surface hydrology um, sort of, uh, you know, splitting into modeling and terrestrial hydrology and climate change. Notice that like climate change, um, you know, does not have like a subsurface uh, like, you know, uh, split, you know, merging into it. Um, so uh, you can also see uh, like modeling, you know, uh, modeling sort of like, you, you know, being, um, uh, you know, uh, containing both like surface and subsurface uh, processes. Uh, so modeling is basically uh, for those who are not uh, like hydrologists. So modeling is uh, like a computer a simulation of natural processes. Uh, in like you know, in a very crude sense, uh, so uh, we can we can see other nuances happening. So climate change is splitting into like forecasting and like extreme events and soil moisture and like you know these that are sort of nuances keep increasing. But what we also see is like you know merging. So we can see like hydraulic modeling and like flow and transport. So these are basically subsurface uh, processes. <clears throat> so they uh, like you know combine. Uh, or like, you know, merge into flow transport and modeling. And you can also see the same for uncertainty research, like, you know, there's subsurface uncertainty research and like, you know, surface sub uh, uncertainty research that's, uh, that are sort of merging. So, uh, so this sort of like gives us an intuition about like how the model, uh, you know, uh, thinks or the, how the model like, you know, considers the topics and it just sort of helps us understand it better. Um, 
And so if we move on to the next uh, sort of our analysis, and this is a very interesting one, uh, we, uh, we are looking at the intertopic correlation. So we are considering two topics and, it's, um, and within the entire data set. And we want to understand like how the two topics are sort of like, you know, uh, appearing uh, or sort of like how likely they are uh, to appear within uh, that corpus. So you can see, uh, so this, le the left part here is, uh, the left diagram here is positive correlations and the negative diagram uh, here is the negative correlations uh, or the one on the right is negative correlations. So you can see, uh, you know, uh, you can see things that make sense, okay? Uh, so you can see like hydrogeology and subsurface flow and transport sort of uh, like, you know, appearing together uh, quite a bit. And you can also see the same for like uh, groundwater and hydrogeochemistry and water quality. That's because like these are all subsurface processes. And uh, you can also see, and this is very interesting, uh, like a strong relationship between climate change and human interventions, and also climate change and precipitation variability. Since like, you know, precipitation research, uh, like a lot of it goes towards climate change research as well. And uh, so you can see like, um, the two modeling topics of so modeling and forecasting and modeling and calibration, um, they're sort of like um, connected with uncertainty and they're sort of like sitting there. Uh, so that's uh, just shows like, you know, um, like, you know, there's more scope of uh, modeling, uh, uh, like calibration and modeling uh, sort of forecasting being applied in other disciplines. So you can also see some like, you know, correlation between uh, like uncertainty and subsurface flow because uh, like, you know, uh, groundwater researchers and hydrogeologists uh, like also use uh, uh, subsurface like uncertainty quite a bit. And so here uh, in the negative like correlations part, so you can see a lot of these correlations that are like sort of negative and um, you can see like groundwater, hydrogeology and subsurface flow and transport, like they are sort of interconnected. Um, uh, so uh, what what this analysis does is that like it, it, it helps us like, you know, uh, see the like the topics that are like, you know, um, that uh, that are like communicating with each other more like more compared to the topics that are not. So this is uh, some interesting insight um, and yeah. Okay, so moving on to the next uh, analysis, which is journal diversity. So before I start explaining this, I want to quickly go over um, entropy. So this is not uh, like Boltzmann, uh, Boltzmann's entropy. Entropy, um, uh, so we're considering Shannon's entropy. So I considered this, uh, improbable events will always have more information in them, according to Shannon. And uh, so uh, like, you know, improbable events. So uh, like, you know, uh, uh, suddenly, you know, we have an earthquake here in Alabama. So that's an improbable event. So that would like, you know, probabilistically contain more information. Uh, so, and thus more entropy, right? Uh, because there are uh, like, there aren't many like, you know, uh, like plate boundaries near Alabama. Um, so, so that's, uh, yeah, so that's uh, kind of what entropy is. So we, we applied the same principle to understand whether uh, like the distribution of topics in different journals are, you know, similar. So you would see that like, you know, uh, this is Journal of Hydrometeorology and, the, and it has some dominant topics because of course, uh, you know, that, that is kind of obvious because it's a hydrometeorology journal and it deals with like atmospheric sciences and like precipitation. So you'd have uh, things like, you know, uh, these topics such as like precipitation observation and like, um, you know, precipitation variability and extremes sort of dominating this journal. But that also means that like, you know, we can predict uh, better like which topics are gonna appear in this journal. So that a little reduces the amount of information, i.e. Uh, the entropy uh, for these like, you know, data set like for, for this journal. Um, conversely, like, you know, a hydrological processes journal, like you also, you see here a lot of like, you know, a more uniform distribution of topics. So we can't really, you know, uh, 
you know, it's it's harder to predict like which topic, uh, um, you know, is going to appear uh, in this, uh, so, like in this data set for hydrological processes. So the entropy is higher. Um, so you can kind of see that. Uh, uh, so like Journal of Hydrology and Hydrological Processes and Hydrology and Earth System Sciences and Hydrologic Science, uh, Sciences Journal, like all of these have kind of the same entropy. Um, so if we move on to the next uh, analysis, which is journal uniqueness. Uh, so journal uh, uniqueness, uh, so basically what we are trying to show here is uh, the distance between journals. Uh, so, uh, so it's how much like the two journals are like, you know, uh, related, uh, so have similar topics or dissimilar topics. So uh, this is a confusion matrix and it sort of shows uh, the, the distance. So if we consider like journal of hydrometeorology and journal of hydrology, since this is a, 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 like, this is predominantly a hydrometeorology journals and this is a hydrology journal, uh, you can see the distance between them is much higher. So like, you know, a darker shade of blue means like the distance is higher. And, if, and for a WRR too, right? With journal of hydrometeorology and WRR, the distance is very high, like, you know, very high. So that means, you know, the distribution of topics uh, that are within these journals, you know, they are, you know, far apart. They're more far apart. So this sort of like gives us um, an insight into like, you know, how the journals, uh, how the topics are distributed within the journals. Uh, okay, so moving on to the next, uh, moving on to the next uh, sort of like our result or slash analysis. Uh, so this is where we uh, like, you know, look at the temporal trend of the uh, distance of journal to, uh, to the entire corpus. And, and the term we use, uh, the term we use it for, um, the term we use uh, for explaining this is uniqueness. So, um, so we can see like, you know, again, a hydrometeorology journal is uh, more unique compared to the uh, other five journals. But then like you, you also see like the uniqueness sort of the index here, uh, the uniqueness index is decreasing, right? So uh, for some of the journals like, like a hydrologic sciences journal, um, it's uh, the uniqueness is increasing, but for uh, but for this for this uh, other three journals like hydrology or system sciences and uh, like uh, water resources research and a journal of hydro hydrology like the uniqueness is decreasing. So that means like you know uh, there the topic distribution within them is becoming more uniform. Um, uh, so yeah, so that kind of brings an end to the results and analysis section. So. So now we are going to move to the, uh, well, uh, to the application section. So uh, we are working on building um, a, a web application, an interactive web application for exploration of hydrologic literature. Uh, and we name it Hydromind. So yeah, so this is the logo I designed, you know, uh, <laughs> like very recently uh, for this uh, tool. So let's have a look at the features of Hydromind. So what we are doing, uh, so what are the features of Hydromind that are like, you know, that we are considering here? So it's, it's gonna have an interactive web-based interface. So anyone can access it over the internet and like, you know, uh, search and explore um, the knowledge in hydrology. Um, uh, and um, so uh, it will be represented through coherent networks in two dimensional spaces. And then we, uh, the user would be able to do journal time and topic based exploration. And so each of these documents would have some like auxiliary slash ancillary information to help, you know, navigate, to help uh, the user navigate. And it would have a section for user feedback and modularity and, and the, a user feedback would uh, like we'd, we'd incorporate, um, you know, the feedback into our research and that's, and thus we'll ensure the modular nature of our, uh, of our tool. So if we consider the framework of these, uh, 
of this web application. So what is uh, what Hydromind is going to do is accept information from the user, retrieve information from a database, create, update, and delete information from the database, and display the information back to the user. Um, so the front end is going to be powered by uh, HTML, uh, CSS, and Bootstrap uh, uh, files. Um, so. So we are going to use like Flask. So Flask is basically our framework for the web application. And it's, so some people prefer Django, but like I, I found Flask to be a more sort of like conducive uh, framework for, uh, you know, building this web application. So this, uh, the back end of the program is uh, in Flask, right? And so, uh, yeah, so, uh, if we consider a very high level overview, so all the data that uh, we will have from our, or we have from our like topic modeling research is gonna be stored in, the da in a database using SQL uh, Alchemy, uh, SQL Alchemy that's um, uh, using Flask, is basically SQL. And uh, so there will be interconnectivity between uh, the backend program of the Python, uh, Python Flask and the front end, which is which the user sees and interacts with. Um, so that's a high level overview of Hydromind. Um, so uh, yeah, okay. So moving on. So let's have a look at the visualization that we are going to use for this uh, tool. So if we consider uh, or like, you know, the tool that uh, or the visualization engine that we have chosen for uh, this uh, web application is D3 uh, Force. So this is a library in JavaScript. And so what it does is it's really interesting because it uh, sort of mimics Newtonian physics. Um, so before I go into like depth uh, about this, I just want to quickly say that, you know, each of these nodes are like, you know, uh, each of these nodes is a paper and each color uh, is a major topical theme, and the distance between the nodes uh, would be um, the uh, like the similarity uh, and the dissimilarity, right? So a higher distance would mean like you know less similar uh, like papers, and like you know uh, distance closer would be uh, like you know more similar papers. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna go into the actual visualization. Of, uh, in a bit, but like I just want to like you know go over uh, like how it does it. So um, it assumes like the engine assumes a constant unit time step and like it assumes a constant unit mass. So force acting on like each of these nodes is equivalent to the acceleration over unit time. So those who, those of us who remember high school physics, it uses like force equals to mass into acceleration, and uh, so. The mass is constant, right? And the time is constant. So the acceleration is basically defined by the uh, weight we put on in between the nodes. And that weight is going to be a measure of the similarity. And uh, for that, we can use multiple methods. So we can use, um, like uh, we can only use uh, the probabilistic similarity that uh, is gen that sort of like we, inf uh, like that, that's from the, like the posterior expectation of our LDA model. Uh, and then we can also combine it with like bibliographic coupling and like, um, you know, co-citation analysis to, you know, uh, to like, you know, explore whether that's going to be better or not, but that's a question for a later date. So I'm, I'm going to uh, stop uh, this presentation and uh, so quickly show you uh, so this is sort of like, you know, the web development in progress or web application development in progress. So um, what we are doing here is like, you know, we, we are enabling the user to choose that uh, journal. So let's say water resources research, journal of hydrometeorology and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, we, the user can also choose the year uh, that they, they wanna search by and then the climate, uh, sorry, and, and, the, and the topic they wanna search by. So any topic they choose. And then after they click submit, it's going to like, uh, generate this interactive visualization, right? So notice like how it's uh, arranging, right? So notice how it's arranging uh, following sort of like, or sort of mimicking Newtonian physics. So when you browse over each of these nodes, you, uh, like it'll show you 
um, the different uh, sort of like papers that are being represented here. And again, like each of each colors is a major topical theme. Here you can see a cluster here. Uh, so the, this, uh, these, all of these papers belong to a major topical theme, a topical theme. And then these papers also belong to a cluster together also belong to a topical theme. So uh, you can do also do fun thing. You can just play around with it and like, you know, see how, um, you know, it re rearranges itself. Uh, so, and, and so we would also have like, you know, ancillary information. So whenever you click on these uh, sort of nodes, we, you'll also get, uh, you know, uh, information about like authors and like, you know, co-authors and uh, some other uh, information that we can extract from the metadata. Awesome. So uh, yeah, so that brings an end to the presentation. Um, and like, you know, we'll, we can take questions. Thanks, Mash. Okay, cool. All right. Should I should I stop screen sharing? Um, it, whatever you want to do. If if you think you might need to refer back to it, it's fine to leave it up. But feel free to drop it off. If you yeah, want. I'll I'll just leave it up for the time being. If if uh, I want to refer back to it at some point. Do we have any questions about uh, the processes or uh, anything else that Mash has been uh, discussing? I guess one question I, hey, I would um, have. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, uh, my name is Heather Templeton. I work in the College of Nursing um, at mm -hmm. UA, and I appreciate yeah. you sharing this uh, uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I'm Thank just you. wondering if you have any, um, and I got here late, and I apologize. I had a um, conflict, but uh, do you have any publications that um, we might be able to look at that might share a little bit more uh, about your process? Yes, yes, we uh, we have uh, we have it on Earth Archive. Uh, I should have shared, or like, yeah, I, I probably should have shared it before the meeting. But like, I'm I'm going to forward it to Kevin, and like, you know, Kevin, if you can, like, you know, send it over to the participants at a later time. Yes, I can send out an email follow up. Um, we did record this session today, so we'll also be po posting that somewhere, and I'll let everyone know, and I can uh, provide that link as well to the uh, publication. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that paper is in review, uh, like uh, at uh, Water Resources Research, uh, but like, um, so the preprint is uploaded on Earth Archive, so you can uh, access it and have a look at it. And if you have questions, like, feel free to email us. Uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here we have another question in chat. Uh, were there any comparisons done between how much more efficient the retrieval of good journal articles was using uh, this versus using advanced searches of the same topics using library with subscriptions to all these journals? So I, yeah, I think the question is, are, did, did you compare the information you were finding through proprietary routes versus uh, maybe open source routes. Is that, am I getting that right, Margaret? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we we ha like haven't yet done that analysis, but like it's on the cards. Uh, so right now we are exploring. So, so if I understood the question correctly, you're asking like whether we compared like the full text articles versus the abstracts uh, that we acquired. Uh, well, I think what she's asking is um, more than that would be, um, did you see, I guess she's wondering about differences that you might see um, between the information you can access through something like the proprietary databases that mm -hmm. UA provides access to through its libraries versus uh, more open access uh, type journals or um, through something like Google Scholar, which uh, it, you know, will not necessarily connect with a library uh, database. I guess it depends if you're on campus, it will, but uh, outside. Yeah, we, yeah, we have not, we have not explored that yet, but it's a really good, like, you know, arena. Um, so this basically, like, what we are trying here is to, like, you know, allow a, a sort of enable a contextual understanding a contextual and uh, understanding of the thematic structure of uh, uh, like 
you know the journals in question right so uh, what are what are the topics and uh, so how are these topics varying and over time we want to be able to do like you know uh, we want to be able to build more refined topics and sort of like you know segregate the data according to that and like uh, we want to want to be able to like you know uh, or at least in my mind i want to be able to predict like you know papers uh, that, or, you know, predict the topics that are going to trend in the future or like, you know, that are going to be popular in the future. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of like, you know, in a, in a strictly research perspective. So uh, that's that. I also want to build like sort of an Alexander library of uh, like hydrologic stressors. Uh, so, so those are the things we're looking at, but like we haven't had a chance to compare it, uh, like, you know, with uh, the uh, tools that are available um yeah uh you're muted yeah Kevin. sorry uh, i think i was unmuted and then i muted to speak it was strange um do you have a, a hypothesis yet uh regarding um what a tool like this might or how a tool like this might affect uh the field uh, and what i mean is you know in your research thus far it seemed to indicate that uh, thematically, uh, most of the journals are getting less unique, uh, and, and would uniqueness increase or continue to decrease with more access to the information, a, a greater understanding of, of uh, you know, how, um, how everyone is approaching these things differently? Do you think, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, the thing is like, you know, these are only six journals and we want to like induct like more and more of these journals uh, to have an understanding whether like, you know, the, uh, the uniqueness is decreasing because uh, like, you know, some uh, like authors are preferring more specialized journals or vice versa. Um, so, so we have to do some, you know, analysis on that. Like we have to study that and see, uh, like, you know, take into consideration the entire like hydrology corpus and see that. Um, yeah. Uh, so what's the other question that you said? Um, Looks like we have one. Uh, what kind of software have you utilized for this project, uh, Python or other programs? Yeah, so we, we, the language, the programming language we used is uh, Python. Um, and uh, so you can, you can also do it on R or JavaScript. There are multiple libraries uh, that are available online and there's just so much resource on the internet nowadays now that everyone's trying to do like uh, machine learning and natural language processing. So make, make use of those resources. But for me, like, uh, for me, like I find Python as the most conducive to data science uh, and like JavaScript more conducive to like visualizations. Uh, so, uh, so that, uh, you know, some of the languages that you might consider. Yeah, and um, Vincent's asking a question that I, I think you and I discussed the first time you came in to talk about this project. And yeah. he's curious if the data in the abstracts is enough to capture the thematic uh, information you're looking for, or it, it is full text uh, really what you need? Yeah, yeah, that, that is something like, you know, I'm still exploring. So uh, you know, full text versus uh, like the corpus, but like we're, uh, right now we're also exploring dynamic topic models, uh, which like, you know, takes the temporal uh, sort of the timestamps into account. Uh, we are also looking to build like a priori uh, sort of networks uh, for uh, these, uh, like for training this topic models. Apparently one of our colleagues at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, like she, she did this and like it's sort of like um, what she thinks like it gave her better topics. So that those are the things we are exploring right now. Um, so it's, uh, it's a dynamic process we're learning <laughs> uh, as we go by. Yeah. I, I guess one question I have, um, since you were the first, you know, person I've worked with um, that had utilized cross the Crossref API this extensively, did uh, how was that process? Did you think it was easy enough to work with? So, if if you know how to build a web scraper, it's easy. Uh, uh, like it's easy in a sense that like once you have the API token, you can have it like uh, within the web scraper. So. 
uh, Gray is the expert in this. So he he built he built those scrapers, and uh, and we have like you know we have the papers in our repository. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, if you know how to build those scrapers, then like uh, you're in luck. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? I just mentioned this is great. Just since Nash mentioned my name, um, we we didn't have any problems with the APIs. Once we got everything approved through the library, um, we had to be careful about. Down, uh, maxim, uh, downloading under sort of the minimum daily volume. And I think you helped us work with that. But other than that, the process was pretty seamless. It's been a while, so I don't remember all of the details. But once we got things worked out with you at the library, um, it, it worked pretty well. The, the only other thing I'd add, and Nash sort, sort of said this, but I just want to clarify, some journals are really easy to, do, to write web scrapers with. And we did that um, just because we could figure out how to construct the PDF links. And, and in retrospect, we probably should have worked with you to do that, but we did all that before we kind of met you. And then uh, once we found some, some journals that, that were harder to, to download, um, you know, Kevin and, and other people at the library were really helpful to help us get all the resources we need. Well, thank you, yes. Um... Let's see, um, another question from Adrian. Um, could this be used to streamline literature reviews? Uh, wh what do you mean by streamlining? Uh, like, I'm sorry, English is still my second uh, so, language. So what, kind of what I'm, ask, what I'm asking is, could this be used to gather a bunch of information you need um, as background for, to write another paper without really reading the scientific literature? Uh, yeah, so okay, so what you're talking about is synthesizing uh, like information in a sort of or summarizing the information. Uh, so yeah, so the, this, the, I mean, like, like, this is a precursor to such a tool, like if you want to do that, like this sort of like acts as a precursor to do that, it's because like, so like, you know, when you're when you're exploring like topic, um, like based on topics, time and journals and um, like, you know, you're, you're looking for a certain topic and then like, you know, you have this like visualization space where you can see like, okay, these papers are together. So these authors must also be related to each other. And then like, you know, over time, like, you know, when we develop this tool further uh, and have more metadata associated with it, maybe like, you know, we can build some like, you know, synthesis, uh, synthesis engine uh, to like, you know, uh, synthesize or summarize the information, but uh, there's still like, you know, a fair bit to go before we reach that point. Uh, but yeah, it's a precursor to that. Gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, one thing I'll mention, um, since um, you know, Gray brought this up, you know, uh, several years ago, when folks started doing this type of work, and, and yeah, I guess in the early days of web scraping, um, you know, there weren't quite as many copyright protections in place that would um, stall your efforts or uh, cause problems for you in that process. And in recent years, all of the publishers have sort of caught on to the things that were being done, uh, you know, not just for legitimate research, but also for uh, nefarious reasons, uh, you know, um, gaining access and, and, and uh, making freely available, you know, content that they want to charge money for. Um, and so that's changed things a little bit. And I'll just let you know, the University Libraries is committed to uh, supporting text data mining, uh, but there is a process that has to occur these days where we get in touch with the, the uh, publishers and, and sort of work through them to make sure that we can get access. But, um, you know, if, if this type of work uh, is of interest to you, just uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and if I'm not the best person, we've got several uh, folks within the library who sort of work with this type of uh, tech. So, um, I'll do my best to point you in the right direction and we'll work uh, with vendors if we can to gain access if we don't already have access. Um, through the Crossref API, we, we can access a lot of uh, the Springer content and Elsevier content, which is, you know, as you know, uh, you know, several thousand 
uh, different journals. So uh, we've got some some good access there. However, um, you know, just reach out if, if you want to start a project like this, or you're not really sure where to start. But um, if there's no other questions, uh, I'd like to thank Mash for his time and uh, a really interesting presentation. So thank you, Mash. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Uh, thanks to everyone for you know coming in and listening to me. Uh, I really love this project. So yeah, sh shoot me an email for with any questions if you, if you have any. Uh, so again, and thanks Kevin for like you know arranging all of this. Uh, uh, no problem. It's great. Yeah, no I'm happy to. I'm happy to communicate science in any way possible. <laughs> Great, great. And I will uh, send everyone an email follow up with this uh, with a link in case you want to share it with anyone else that maybe couldn't make it any of your colleagues. Uh, and I can share Mash's uh, email address as well if you if you're looking to reach out to him with additional questions. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you next time. We've got several uh, coming up and um, I'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you.